Immunogy bovine IgG is a point of care test which can reliably determine IgG or antibody levels in calves up to 42 days of age. Now, best of all, samples can be collected using a pinprick type lancet, meaning that farmers as well as vets can collect their own blood samples. Now, this technology has been developed by the Immunogy Consortium. The Immunogy Consortium consists of Butelar, Soma Bioscience, Synergy Farm Health, and they've come together to try and address a critical industry need. Now, to introduce myself, my name is Rachel Mallet. I'm a veterinary advisor at Bimeda, and Bimeda are commercialising this technology, and I'll be chairing today's webinar. Bimeda, if you haven't come across us before, are a global animal health company. We have a presence in over 80 countries and we're passionate about animal health and welfare and doing our part to facilitate sustainable protein production. The webinar today will run for approximately one hour and will then be followed by a Q&A session where you'll have the chance to put your questions to our speakers. So if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, please pop them into the Q&A box and we'll make sure to get around to handling all of those questions at the end of the session. Now, if you do enjoy, enjoy today's webinar and you'd like to share it with your colleagues, we will be sending out an email following today's event with a link to the recording as soon as it's uploaded to our website. Now, all of our con content today is fantastic and extremely interesting, but I would really encourage you to stick around for Alistair's session looking at IgG impact on daily live weight gains and antibiotic use, which kicks in approximately 45 minutes into the session. Now, on that note, we do have a panel of fantastic speakers today, including Alistair Hayton, veterinary surgeon, RCVS specialist in cattle health and production and director of Synergy Farm Health. Dr Ginny Sherwin, veterinary surgeon, clinical associate professor and young stock specialist, University of Nottingham. Joe Dunbar, managing director of Soma Bioscience and Dominic McKenzie, farm manager at Butelar Group. Now, on that note, I'm delighted to hand over to Alistair Hayton to introduce Immunogy Bovine IgG and to set the scene for why this development was desperately needed. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, good afternoon to all. Thank you for joining the webinar. Um, so I'm just, as I say, going to talk very briefly through why we saw the need for this test to be developed and uh, the rationale behind it. So the, the impetus for this actually came from specific challenges from both clients and a retailer that they wish to see a reduction in use in the uh, amount of antibiotics being used in rearing units for dairy calves entering the beef supply chain. As you will be aware, this is an increasingly important part of beef um, supply. 50% of UK beef now is coming from this, this area. Now, it's well accepted and known that it is a relatively high use of antibiotics in these rearing units compared to other uh, areas of cattle production, but that use is for a good reason in that obviously this is a high risk environment for disease. We're bringing calves from multiple sources at a young age and mixing them together and obviously that creates a lot of uh, risk for disease outbreak. And we also know that if disease does occur, that that obviously have significant impacts on health, welfare and productivity, not just in the short term while the uh, calf is fighting the disease, but also in the longer term in that it's very likely that affected calves are going to suffer from poorer feed conversion efficiency, uh, longer time to rear and lower carcass weights at the end, all of which will have significant econo economic impacts on the business and what is a very marginal business to start off with. So how do we square that circle between the fact that we need and want to try and reduce antibiotics in these systems but also that we need to maintain uh, health, welfare and productivity. And the answer seemed to lie uh, in trying to establish a, a, a sort of point of entry test that would allow us to understand which calves were metabolically robust and, and were able to cope with disease challenge and which were going to be susceptible to problems such that the potential to manage them in an individual manner could be could be done. And while we looked at a lot of uh, potential options for how that might be best achieved, the obvious low hanging fruit came, came back to 
assessing the amount of antibody or IgG that the calves had received from their colostrum supply. For reasons being, obviously, we know that it's highly correlated to the risk of disease and mortality and productivity. So we really know that it's it's very much uh, a central part of, of that. And also because it is still such a common problem. And uh, this paper from 21, you know, comes to the conclusion that it's still looking at the prevalences across the world, that it's still a serious problem of this failure of passage transfer, i.e. that the calves haven't received enough antibody, is still a serious problem that needs to be addressed worldwide. And just to sort of look at the UK within that, and this is uh, courtesy of Andrew Henderson from LNM, who performed a study, a recent study on this, on over 6,750 calves. And the the worrying number is that roughly a quarter, 24% 20, of those calves showed a failure of passive transfer, i.e. they had insufficient antibodies as a result of their colostrum management. And a third of 14%, so taken us up to 40, had marginal levels. So we still had an awful lot of calves that were going to be more susceptible to problems than we would like them to be. So while this, this test had a, uh, a sort of origin in trying to address a problem within the beef supply chain, uh, these, these prevalence figures do illustrate the fact that actually we also have an opportunity within the source farms themselves, the dairy farms themselves, because we've got a problem that's very widespread. And we know that farms that um, have active monitoring for failure passive transfer are far less likely to have problems and, and calves suffering from that problem because they spot the problem and actively manage it. So the question is, we, everyone must be bored of being told how important colostrum is, and yet we still have this problem, in the, and we know that there is a solution in improving the monitoring from that. And the question is, why surveillance for this is still relatively low? And I think part of that answer is in just the practical difficulties and uh, of, of, of samples being gained to do so. So what we wanted to develop, um, both to address this problem at collection centres, but also for dairy farms, was a sample that didn't require a skilled operator, veterinary surgeon to take it. So it could be done at, at, at pen side. A process of testing that was simple, quick, easy to do, and allowed, therefore allowed rapid processing results. because We want these results immediately. We don't want them five days later. That obviously it had to be cost effective, so it allowed frequent use, so there wasn't any barrier there. And importantly, because so many of the current systems for monitoring antibody levels are restricted, and I'll come on to this later on, to younger calves, a, a test that we, we could use in older calves. And hopefully by the time we finish this webinar, you will agree that we think we might well have achieved that, but um, I'll leave you to judge and I shall pass you back to Rachel. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alistair, for that introduction to this new technology. I think based on that teaser, we're all excited to hear more and hear about the applications during today's session. Now, as Alistair alluded to, we all know that colostrum is incredibly important, so we're definitely not going to preach to you about things like quality, quantity, time, fr time frames for getting colostrum in, which I know is very commonly spoken about. Um, but what may be surprising is just how common failure of passive transfer still is. So with that, I'm pleased to hand over to Dr Jenny Sherwin to explore this further. Great, thank you, Rachel. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming and for allowing me to speak. I suppose, as Rachel and Alistair have alluded to, the question is, why are we still talking about colostrum? And actually, before we go on to colostrum, I first wanted to take a step back. This data is taken from BCMS data. So this is a big study that was done out of Nottingham by Bobby Hyde in 2020, and it was BCMS data for a decade, looking at what our mortality rates were based on births and registered deaths. And the graph that you've got here is what the um, mortality rate was for calves within the first three months of life from 2011 to 2019. The solid line is the dairy male, the next line down is then the dotted one is a dairy female, and then the two lines below were the non-dairy male and female. From somebody who spends a large amount of their time talking about pre-weaning calves, it's really sad to see that despite a huge industry push, our mortality rates, if we focus here on the dairy female, have stayed pretty static at 5% over a decade. So whilst there is this desire and this requirement for us to improve, 
our mortality rate data says actually we aren't getting better. And when we think about why calves die, predominantly in that pre weaning period, it comes down to either neonatal scours or bovine respiratory disease. As we know, bovine respiratory disease tends to have that high morbidity, but not often a high mortality. However, when we look at neonatal scours, we sadly get both high morbidity and high mortality. And with this sitting at 5% for dairy females, we're saying that one in 20 of our dairy females won't make it past the first three months. So this is a huge waste and also an opportunity for us to act and improve. If we think about neonatal scours and that they are the predominant cause potentially of this mortality, for me, it always comes down to two things, colostrum management and cleanliness. So if we then look at where we are in terms of colostrum management, we're measuring our failure of passive transfer. If we look globally, we can see that we've got quite a wide variation. We've got Julia McFarlane's work from 2016, which mirrors the similar results to Andrew Henderson's work in both England and Wales, and they're both sitting at around that 25%. So we're saying back in kind of 2015 and Andy's samples are more recently, one in four of the animals tested at 25% had a failure of passive transfer. Ali Haggerty's work from Scotland, the Scottish are doing slightly better than uh, England and Wales here, but we're still at nearly 15%, so nearly one in eight. Similar findings are found in the States and also in Canada and down in Australia and New Zealand, we're looking more like one in three of uh, the animals tested having failure of passive transfer. And similarly with the Czech Republic, whose box seems to have slightly disappeared, I think they're at 34.6. The other key finding from all of these is the fact that actually we've got quite a lot of between farm variation. So whilst we talk about averages, I hate an average, an average doesn't tell me anything. And also to our individual farmers, our clients that we're trying to help, that national average doesn't mean anything. We want to know what's happening on their farm and also what's going on between the farms, between our different clients. And within that as well, what happens between different cohorts? When we have management changes, is it time of year, things like that. So whilst we've got some idea of averages, we've still got some work to do at looking at what actually do we mean is going on in terms of failure of passive transfer and prevalence. Why is it so, so important? Well, if we look at Didier Rabisson's uh, systematic review from 2016, failure of passive transfer increased the rate of mortality by more than double alongside the fact that increases our risk of BRD by what by one times 0.175 sorry and also of diarrhea by more than one and a half so we're putting these animals at increased risk of disease before we've even started the other thing that is of interest and this is taken from Sandra Godden's work and from Lombard in 2020 Traditionally, we've always had this pass fail aspect to failure of passive transfer. It's either a yes or a no using that 55 mg per deciliter or 8.4 percent bricks or 20 on the ZST. Yes, we're good or no, we're not. Actually, the work from the Lombard study in 2020, which is based on Sandra Godden's work, says actually maybe we should think a bit broader and as Alistair alluded to with Andy Henderson's work, you know, we're starting to categorise it and split it further. And the work that came out of the state showed that actually maybe we should split it into four categories. We've got excellent, we've got good, we've got fair and we've got poor. The reason being, and I've just put the non-disease probability here graph, is actually um, we're going to have an increased risk of disease. You can see with poor, which is that bottom line, that increased risk of disease gets massive, especially within that first three weeks of life. The middle two lines that are quite close together are the good and fair, but you can see actually the calves that receive excellent, so this is higher than that 55 mg um, per deciliter, their risk is much lower. So I think in some respects, we also need to take this a step forwards in terms of our management. Is a pass fail good enough or should we be looking at pushing for excellence within some of our herds? And whilst it's just the non-disease probability graph here, you saw the same thing with mortality. So the trends are there to say the, uh, the further we push colostrum management and excel, the better results we should get. In terms of is it costing our farmers? Alistair's has already alluded to this, but again, this is from the same uh, meta-analysis by Didier Rabisson. 
But actually, yes, it is. He estimated that in our dairy animals, it's costing around 60 euros on average and our beef 80 euros. But interestingly, when you looked at that kind of 95% range, it hugely varies, of which most of the time it relates to the prevalence of failure of passive transfer. When you split down the costs as to where do the costs come from, we've kind of got the four areas. Unsurprisingly, mortality and disease both come into it. And you can see how that impacts kind of the beef more than the dairy. But also thinking about that future performance, that average daily uh, weight gain is really important and where we're also seeing gains. And that's something we'll talk about in a bit more detail later as to why colostrum might be playing that role. So what is so magic about colostrum? We spend all of our life talking about antibodies and we'll spend this webinar talking about antibodies. And we're after checking, have we got enough IgG1 into the bloodstream? But there are lots of other things that are within the colostrum that I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes talking about in a bit more detail to say, actually, there's there's a lot more to colostrum than just antibodies. I will, however, start with antibodies, which we know are 70 to 80 percent of the total protein content of colostrum. But we have got these three different types of antibodies in there. IgG is the predominant one, the one that we all know about that we test for. Is it in the bloodstream? Hugely important from an immunological point of view, but also from that, uh, from our ability these days to say, yes, we're happy they've had enough antibody. But we've also got these other two classes, which are IgA and IgM. Both of these act as mucosal protectants. OK, so this is the antibody response we stimulate when we do things like intranasal vaccines. We're after that local mucosal protection. We're not going to vaccinate these calves to create that within the gut, but we do have the magic of colostrum that will provide those IgA and IgM for us. And basically they sit there and they lower that bacterial load or viral load within the gut by binding any free bacteria or viruses. So whilst we think about antibodies, IgG phenomenally important, but we've also got IgA and IgM playing a role as well. Other aspects of the other maternal immune cells, of which we've got the macrophages and the neutrophils, so those kind of first responders, phagocytosing, um, and just basically, again, lowering that pathogen um, population within the gut. But we've also got T and B cells who are orchestrating that immune response. So these maternal cells can, again, aid that local gut immunity and help to put it into a more positive um, aspect and help fight infection. The other things we've got are the non-Pacific antimicrobial peptides, of which there are loads, things like lactoferrin, lactoperoxidase, lysodimes, really important for um, things like the lactoferrin, reducing the iron absorption that some bacteria require and therefore preventing their use. We know as well that they have a shift in their micro uh, biota within the gut. So again, you know, we talk about friendly bacteria and trying to promote that type of aspect, but actually these non-specific antimicrobial peptides are, th are thought to help favour that. We also know they act in terms of immune uh, modulation and with it as well impact how well the intestinal cells mature. So again, creating that healthy gut environment. The other one is cytokines, obviously the um, messengers for our immune system, again, helping us to recruit the right cells into the right place for an inflammatory response if one's required, or if it's not required, reducing the inflammatory cells that are present. So again, really important, and especially in terms of pro-inflammation, where we're helping cell migration and recruitment in response to those GI pathogens. The other one to mention is the growth and metabolic factors. OK, so there are quite a few of those. I've just picked out three. And I suppose for me, the most important thing is these are here and they're regulating that development of the GI tract within the bovine neonate. So we're stimulating mucosal growth, stimulating brush border enzymes development. We're altering intestinal DNA synthesis rates and which ones are synth synthesized. We're increasing our villus size, which therefore increases our ability to absorb and take up glucose. So hopefully this has shown you that, you know, whilst colostrum is really important from an IgG1 point of view, there's loads of other things within it. And actually 
the more we can focus on cholesterol, the better benefits we can have. And that's without even thinking about the fact that it's got a really high fat content, which our neonates really do need, considering that they lose all their brown fat within that first 24 hours. The other interesting thing to think about is, OK, we know about mortality, we know about the disease risk, but actually, does colostrum have any long term impacts? It's an older study now from 2005, but it's still a really nice study. And I know that the number of carbs are lower than we would like from a, a robustness point of view, but I think it proves a point. In this study, we had two sets of carbs. Some received two litres of colostrum, some received four. Otherwise, they were reared exactly the same. We can see the daily live weight gain by having four litres of colostrum increased by a kilo a day. And I'll go to a kilo a day, sorry, from 0.8, and I'll discuss why that might be later on. Age at first insemination was very similar. That's fine and isn't surprising. However, longevity being a huge factor that we're now getting more and more interested in from a sustainability point of view, as well as health and welfare and economics, we had significantly more of those animals still hanging around after second lactation. But also really interestingly, milk yield in the first and second lactation increased by over a thousand litres, which at 47 pence per litre is 482 pounds. So not something to be laughed at, especially if you've got a farm that's bringing in, say, 50 heifers a year. And that's just the difference of swapping it from a two litre colostrum feed to a four litre colostrum feed. So I suppose the question is, what's happening on day one of life that's then impacting the performance of those cows more than two years later? And this is where we then start to think about epigenetics. So epigenetics is basically how does the external world, environmental factors impact how we express different genes? We know that different genes can be turned on and off, and we know that when we turn them on, we can change how we turn them on and we can make stable alterations to that DNA structure. And in doing so, we're going to then change how that gene is then expressed. I am going to step slightly out of my comfort zone to explain it in a way that is how it works in my brain and how, for me, is a really phenomenal uh, example of epigenetics. So we take a little bee larvae that's sat in a beehive. OK, it's got two options in life. It can become a worker bee or it can become a queen bee. And which one of those two it becomes purely depends on the sugar content of the nectar. The reason being is if there's low sugar levels in the nectar, it means that flowers are pretty scarce. OK, so actually low sugar levels mean we need a lot more worker bees for this bee colony to survive because we're having to go really far to search for food. This is hard. So if there's low level of sugar in the nectar, that little bee larvae will become a worker bee. On the flip side, if there's loads of sugar in the nectar, it means, right, we've hit the jackpot, we're in the right environment to support loads of bee colonies. There's lots of resources around. So loads of sugar switches the genes on and that bee larvae will become a queen bee because that environment can support multiple bee colonies. If you've ever looked at the difference between a worker bee and a queen bee, anatomically, it is phenomenal that just the content of sugar can make such a difference in what this bee larvae develops into. And then you start to wonder what are we doing in our calves with that early life epigenetic effect, both in utero, but also within those first few days, but also few, first few weeks of life. This was taken further by looking at the impact of extended colostrum feeding and what impact that has. So these are calves that were all fed colostrum uh, initially and then their diet for the first two to 14 days of life was either five kilograms of just whole milk or 4.65 kilograms of whole milk and 0.35 kilograms of colostrum or 4.3 kilograms of whole milk and 0.7 kilograms of colostrum. After that, from day 14 to 61, they were all fed five kilos of whole milk and a step down weaning process. So what did we see? <clears throat> well, what you can see is in that first day one to 60, the daily live weight gain, if you had the 0.7 kilos of colostrum in that 14, first 14 days, increased. That increase didn't stop in that pre-weaning period. Post-weaning for 20 days, we also saw that increase. So overall, 
between the five kilos of whole milk and the 4.3 kilos of whole milk plus 0.7 kilos of colostrum, we've got an extra 0.1 kilo a day growth. What is that? Are we turning on different genes? Sadly, I don't have the exact answers, but that is where some hopefully new exciting science will come through. And interestingly, when they looked at it, it was nothing to do with starter intake. OK, so the colostrum didn't impact the starter intake. It did impact that daily live weight gain we've discussed. But what you can see here is it's also impacting that feed efficiency, not only in that pre weaning period, but also in that post weaning period, which is really important when you think economically, when that is the best time to grow calves, that actually whatever we've done in giving that extended colostrum feeding is impacting how well that animal can get energy out of the diet we give them. So in summary, why do I think this is really, really important? So this is work from the SRUC, from Tim Geraghty. And again, taking top level data, he looked at where the big wastages were on farm. And what we're looking at here, as you can see, in terms of both beef and dairy, 21% of wastage was due to mortalities, which, as we've said, we know we have a problem with pre-weaning uh, mortality rates. So that is an area that we can focus on. And also that 55% of wastage was due to decreased daily live weight gain. Don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you feeding colostrum will solve all of your daily live weight gain issues, but it clearly has an impact on how efficiently those animals can get feed and setting them up for life. So in terms of what I would always say, I was the annoying vet that would always take blood samples every time I visited because I want to know what's going on every time I'm on farm. If we only test reactively, the horse is bolted. I don't know whether I've had changes. So for me, I'm really excited to see a test that we can use on farm, because the more data we have about this, the better we can get. And I would love to move away from this pass fail. And can we push for excellence within our farms? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. A really informative session. I really enjoyed the bee analogy as well, made it very real for me. I think just, just looking at the key takeaway, as you rightly say, we bang on about antibodies so much in colostrum. And while antibodies are what we measure and what give us an indication of how much colostrum they had, it's all that other good stuff that they miss out on, like your growth factors, your hormones. And so that does explain why even if we keep them free from infectious disease, they still do not go on to perform as well and we just don't get as much out of those animals. So thank you very much. Now, Alistair has already touched on why this new solution is desperately needed by the industry. I'll now hand back to Alistair just to explore this a little bit further and explain some of the benefits of the immunity test versus the existing options. Thank you, Rachel, and hello again. Um, so there has a wide range of uh, test methodologies for assessing the amount of antibody in a, in a calf's blood. And some of these are direct measures of the antibody level in IgG, and some of them rely on indirect measures that correlate well with that typically uh, total protein. Um, there have been reviews and those one, you know, the papers out there that look at the, the relative merits, et cetera, of these. But I'm just going to focus today, not on all of them, but just a few that are probably the most common and relevant and, uh, and all talked about. So the first one I want to cover is uh, radial immunodiffusion assay, which is also a mouthful to say and usually gets called RID as a result. Um, the first thing to say is this is an expensive, very laboratory uh, heavy based test. So it's not a test that we would ever consider using on a widespread commercial basis for testing calves. The reason why I've included it is it's held up as the gold standard in the literature for the best method of, you know, the the best method for getting the most accurate assessment of exactly how much antibody is there right? in the most accurate test method. And as a result, it's a test that we had to consider. And when we were, and we'll come on to this data later, assessing the quality of the immunity test, how well it performed, uh, you know, do, should we use it in comparison against this RID test? Now, we took advice from two professors of immunology on this one, but also in our own work, and the answer is no, and really it isn't and shouldn't be considered a gold standard test. It, as I say, it's a very complex test to run, not least in the reading of the test. And perhaps the difficulties of the test are best illustrated by the fact that the um, if you run a, a sample uh, twice with the test, the, quite often the 
the variability is more than 10% between the two results, i.e. that the same sample using the same test gives Y variation results. So the advice from the professors was that actually it isn't really a gold standard assay and certainly fits with our experience and that actually their advice was that we should use an ELISA based, IgG ELISA based test to compare immunity with and therefore that's what we did and so we really explain that part of the uh, external validation that uh, Joe will talk about. So using the more commonly, the test that we're more commonly familiar with and the ones Ginny has already alluded to, um, this is the one I was brought up with, the zinc sulfate dividity test. It's a lab based test. It's an indirect measure of antibody based on uh, precipitating out uh, total globulin levels in the blood, looking at the turbidity of that sample and correlating that with the likely level of immunoglobulin or antibody. Um, it's a relatively accurate test. It's it's not too bad, uh, with sort of 70 percent uh, specificity, so false positive rate. So not perfect um, and it is affected by some things as red cell bloat, red cell breakdown, sample hemolysis, reaction time, ambient temperature, running the test, etc. Importantly, it's going, as I say, it's a lab based test and it is going to require a blood sample to be taken from a jugular uh, to be able to run the run the test. Uh, cost wise, it's it's reasonably it's pretty reasonable. It's not an expensive test, um, but to say it does suffer from those issues of needing a laboratory and needing a, a blood jugular blood sample. Perhaps the most common test we use in the UK and probably worldwide is the refractometry. There are two types: total protein and BRICS. Total protein does what it says on the tin and measures the the total protein in the in the serum or plasma sample, and BRICS measures the total dissolved solids. Again, this is an indirect measure of antibody, um, but it, it is again considered reasonably accurate and we'll come on to atriocarp in a second in relation to that. And because it is relatively cheap and simple to use and therefore low cost, it, that it is adopted fairly widely. But again, it's something that's going to require a, a jugular blood sample to be able to run and it, it does require some sort of you know, precipitation, you know, clotting of the blood or centrifugation to be able to run the sample because it's not wrong on whole blood, it has to be plasma. Importantly, um, it, it's not useful in calves over nine days. So the correlation between total protein and the level of antibody dissipates as the calf gets older and therefore the recommendation and usually what we say is use this test in the, you know, we test calves in the first week of life because of this problem, because as calves get older, the, the correlation with how much antibody is in there dissipates. And uh, we will come on some data that Joe will show later, which were largely taken from older calves, which shows that problem very clearly that we get this very poor lack of correlation. One other thing to say about the test is that um, a number of studies have been performed on, on refractometry and on its accuracy. And, and out of that, a number of different um, cutoffs have been suggested as the most appropriate um, uh, point to determine whether a calf is suffering from failure of passive transfer. And I think that really alludes to the fact that it's not a highly reliable test. The fact that different studies come to conclusions as to what a cutoff should be suggests that we don't get the repeatability that we would necessarily want. And that lack of repeatability is considered to be due to different manufacturers of the refractometry, the level of maintenance and calibration of the equipment uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a reasonable test. It's, it's, that its main value comes from it's simple and the ease to use and its price point rather than because it's a very accurate test. A way of sort of circumnavigating that, and, and this is perhaps replacing the zinc sulfate test, is to use a lab based total protein. So rather than using refractometry, so um, as before, to uh, gauge the amount of protein in the sample, we can do it by a biochemical uh, method, which will give us a more accurate, reliable total protein measure. Um, and in doing so, therefore, we get more consistent results so that, um, for instance, studies suggested that the, the false positive rate, so the overdiagnosis of failure of passive transfer, moves from refractometry of around 72% to 3 in 10 calves and falsely diagnosed to using total protein to 2 in 10. The same issues are uh, apply in terms of requiring a jugular sample and uh, again it's going to be a sample that needs to be sent to the lab so it's not going to be applicable as a sort of pen side test and again because it's relying on total protein to uh, gauge the amount of antibody again it has the same problem that it's not going to be applicable in older calves 
So how does the immunity test differ in that? Well, first of all, it's very it is a direct test, so we're not uh, we are directly measuring the level of IgG, so therefore we're going to get a, a much more accurate understanding of that rather than an indirect method. It is very swift to run, so we get a result on that calf in just 10 minutes. As we, Joe will show shortly, there is excellent correlation with what we revised was gold standard. So laboratory based ELISA methods were showing excellent correlation. So we know we've got a very accurate test. As we'll come on to very shortly, the method of samples are dermal puncture and capillary bleed rather than the jugular sample. So allowing samples to be far more easily collected. Um, there is no preparation required. We're just using a whole blood sample so we don't have to do any other processes, literally take the blood and run it. And again, importantly, and very importantly, in terms of the, the beef world, we can test calves up to 42 days of age on that. And I'll come on to some data, as Rachel's alluded at the start of this presentation um, on that. Thanks, Alistair. So that's over back to Rachel. Thank you. Great, great to hear about how it compares to other technology and in particular how it overcomes some of those common barriers to use by allowing farmers to collect their own samples. And also it just facilitates that immediate veterinary intervention. You're getting a specific number, a quantitative result rather than just a yes or no above threshold or below threshold. But as you've alluded to, I think that ability to use it in those calves up to 42 days of age, that is going to be the real game changer for the industry. Now, in addition to those benefits, we also need reliability, we need accuracy. Soma Bioscience are the experts behind the test technology. So I'll now hand over to Soma's Managing Director, Joe Dunbar, to share more about the reliability and the validation behind the technology. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Alistair just mentioned, this uh, exciting new test is actually a direct measurement. It's a IgG immunoassay on a lateral flow test strip. So our platform is lateral flow. And obviously our good old friend COVID-19 brought the term lateral flow into the more common vernacular. But um, lateral flow technology has been around for quite some time. The first lateral flow tests were the pregnancy tests in the 1970s. Police and Home Office use lateral flow tests for measurement of drugs of abuse, but um, it, it really came more popular and, and I think the, the utility of lateral flow was demonstrated during COVID-19. Now, we'd been developing this uh, particular IgG lateral flow test since way before COVID. It's been in development for about five or six years in total now and there's two key differences between the tests that we've developed and um, these tests that are listed there on the left hand side so a covid test pregnancy or drugs of abuse those ones would all be referred to as semi-quantitative so it's just a positive or a negative or a yes or a no and i think as Ginny said earlier on um, you know, we need to get away from this very binary nomenclature and move to something perhaps a little bit more expressive. So the test we've developed is actually fully quantitative. That means we're going to use a reader, which I'll show you in a, in a little video in a couple of minutes, and that will measure the test line and control lines and express those as a fully quantitative value, just in the same way a laboratory ELISA would. The other fundamental difference between this test is we use what's called a competitive assay as opposed to a sandwich assay. So a sandwich assay would be used on your COVID test or a pregnancy test. So the greater the concentration, the stronger the test line would be. Ours actually works the other way around. So the test line will be weaker, the stronger the um, concentration. And that, that's partly because if you were to look under the, the bonnet, as I call it, if you were to, to break your, your lateral flow test open, you would see a test strip that's formed of all sorts of different components. You have a wicking pad at the end that draws the sample across the, the, the strip to make sure you get the flow right the way across. You have a sample pad where the, the you know we, we filter out some of the grass or 
any any sort of dirt that might be within your sample and then you have your conjugate pad which is just where the the gold labeled antibody the detection antibody is hydrated and then that sample runs across the the test strip um going across two lines that are there all there will always be a control line furthest away just to check that your test has run properly if the value of that control line isn't strong enough it means the test hasn't run properly and the reader will just display fail and there will always be a test line however strong or weak that may be depending upon the concentration so that's the sort of what's under the bonnet the the, the technical factor of the test but the other thing that makes this test very very different from anything else on the market thus far is your ability to just take it with a, a small pinprick and I'm going to uh, hand over back to Alistair again because he's the expert in sampling. Thanks Joe and um, so I'm just going to briefly uh, jump in and show the process of sampling because it is totally novel. Um, what you see is the picture of the Lancet, it's a safety Lancet so you can see that that cap sort of just pulls back to allow you to actually create the uh, puncture and then stays back into place. So uh, very difficult to uh, do yourself some damage when using this this test. So it's been designed carefully on that basis. So I'm just now going to um, run through the actual process of sampling and uh, how that works. So hopefully this will work. So the area we take the sample is just called the nasal plane and just where I'm that finger sort of pointing there. So just at that juncture between the hairless and hairy skin there, it's a nice, easily accessible area. And um, let's see, just highlighted by that area red there. Uh, nice, easily hairless area and it, therefore easy to obtain the blood. Um, obviously between each calf, we just wipe down the, um, the lancet with um, some spirits of cotton wool and then applying a micro hematocrit tube to the uh, to the uh, drop of blood that appears, we can take the sample. Occasionally we get slower bleeds. This is to show that not every bleed happens rapidly. Sometimes you have to wait a fraction, but it's very rare you need to repeat the Lancet. Most of the time, nine out of 10 times, you're gonna rapidly get a small drop of blood, as you can see here, and then we can take the sample. The only really important bit is sort of practical uh, there is when you take the sample, you run the tube below the 90 degree angle, so below below the horizontal. If the, if the hematocrit tube is below the horizontal, the blood flows quickly into the tube, whereas if you, if you hold it above that horizontal line, it just takes that bit longer to fill. So you say it's very well tolerated by the calves, uh, and um, you, you know you, within 10 minutes, you will never know which calves are being tested or not. Then all we have to do is pop that tube into the buffer part, shake it up, and we've got our sample ready to use and test, and that, that is a very stable solution that can be tested you know days later let alone hours and that's it and uh, that hopefully shows you nicely how easy it is to obtain a sample and i'll pass back to joe at this point you might be on mute joe just in case So sorry, so we've got a little video that's going to run that shows you the process of running a sample. Um, there's no other equipment required other than a stopwatch. And as you can see, the user here is just twisting off a little blue cap to reveal a dropper lid and then adding two drops into what we call the sample well of the lateral flow test. So the little round window that should be on, on the left hand side or in this case on the, the, the bottom. So if you're doing a, a series of tests in one session, you might add your drops either 20 or 30 seconds apart, and it's going to run for a, a full 10 minutes. So the, the, the incubation time is 10 minutes. So when you get to around nine minutes, you want to insert your lateral flow test into the adapter, making sure the sample well is on the right and it's highlighted on the, the little plastic holder adapter. And here's the cube I mentioned earlier that's going to give you a quantitative reading. It's very simple, it just has one button, so you press it once to turn it on. It can only fit in that holder one, one way round, so you can't put it in the wrong way round. You press the button again and it will ask for an RFID card. That's the calibration card that tells the cube 
what the test is and what the calibration characteristics are. If you haven't put that card on within about 10 seconds, you'll get that error message. But presuming you've, you've put your card on uh, in, in time, it will reveal test and then you press it one more once more and the scan literally takes four seconds and then it's going to display your your value. So in that case, uh, the, the eagle eyed uh, members of the audience will see that that particular reading was eight milligrams per per mil. So it's it's a very, very simple to use test and you can run through quite a lot of tests very quickly if you did them on a 20 second interval. Um, the question we always get asked is how accurate is is the test? And um, we we've had a lot of internal validation work done, but we also, as part of a, an Innovate UK funded project, had uh, independent research from Ridgeway, or a um, clinical research organisation, and there were 200 samples sent to them from farms collected by Synergy Farm Health. On the left, you can see the laboratory ELISA compared to the refractometry. And Alistair said earlier on, um, the refractometry is a good guide. It's it's by no means perfect, and especially in, in older calves. So the age range of these calves tested would have been anywhere between two and sort of 50 days. And you can see that the correlation of the two tests isn't really that strong, you know, about 0.5 correlation. Whereas the test we've developed, the immunity test on the right hand chart, you can see very, very good correlation with the ELISA in this uh, larger age range of, of calves. So very, very useful. It, it widens the window where this test would be relevant. Again, the eagle-eyed uh, members in the, in the audience will see that most of those values sit just below the line of identity. And that's because when we measure with the with the immunity IgG test on the lateral flow, you're measuring whole blood, whereas in the laboratory, they're spun down first and it's just the plasma um, that's measured. So in whole blood, the values tend to be about 70% of what they would be in plasma. And that's something to bear in mind when you're looking at thresholds. So great agreement with the ELISA. Also, those same samples that Synergy collected that went to Ridgeway were then sent to us blinded and we measured them on our lateral flow here. So this is where Ridgeway have run them on the immunity IgG test and where we've run those same samples. And you can see, especially in the target area below sort of 15, 20 milligram per mil, very, very strong correlation. So an R square of 0.89 is a correlation of you know above uh, 0.95 very good um, repeatable test and of course having having accuracy and repeatability is important we've been doing another project where we've had um, upwards of 700 samples sent as part of a, an innovate funded program and we've found where we've tested these in duplicate the typical cv of the values is is four percent or the mean cv is four percent so for lateral flow that is incredibly good the industry standard whether it's covid or anything like that if you were to measure those quantitatively would be somewhere between 10 or 20 percent so we're we're very proud of the accuracy and repeatability of this um, test that we've developed and, and biomedia are bringing to market for you Excellent. Thank, thanks both Joe and Alistair. Those videos were fantastic for really bringing it to life and just showing how simple it is to collect the sample, but also how quick and easy it is to run that test and get your new, new medical answer. Also great to hear about the validation work just to, to show that it really backs that technology up. Now, not only do we have this fantastic data to show how reliable the test is and the extent of validation, the consortium have also been able to obtain data sets related to calf performance versus initial IgG result. So I'll hand back to Alistair to share the outcome of this work. Almost forgot to unmute myself. That would have been a... Thank you, Rachel. Um, 
So as we sort of discussed at the start, I see the two potential for test use is this traditional um, use within the first week of life on source farms to allow farms to uh, adopt a routine assessment for failure passive transfer and hopefully by doing so achieve more consistent management of colostrum and therefore reduce the incidence and prevalence of the, the, of the problem. Uh, that testing could either be done on farm as we discussed or, or um, the testing, the samples could actually just be taken by the farm and given to the vet so that the black box stays at the, the practice and the samples are run by the vet back at the practice. Likewise, vets potentially could carry the um, the test kit with them and, and allow a sort of real time discussion, go out and test some carbs, get the results straight away and then be able to discuss the, the, the uh, relevance of those results in terms of how things are performing. The other role obviously is this use in collection centre. Now, I wish I'll come on to in a second. Obviously, if we can um, identify which carbs are likely to optimally perform, we've got the opportunity to potentially manage them differently. Um, it might, you know, say, down to sort of rag rate them so the high risk carbs may be high, you know, or, you know, potentially may need to move into some sort of metaphylactic, high risk of metaphylaxis where the, the more robust carbs are less so. Um, longer term, um, and again, I think dependent on, on uh, progression of this, it may well even be that we see the price of calves determined on the outcome of these, these test results. So but we'll come on to the, the uh, data on that in a second. So I'm not going to go into any data on the, the use and importance of antibody levels in the first week of life. As Ginny's already gone through, there's a huge amount of data on the correlation between low antibody levels and the risk of uh, disease and mortality. And therefore, there was been really there's a point proven area for us uh, in, in terms of, of why um, monitoring in this area is of value to the farm and the benefits. As I say, coming back from if we measure, we can manage and we can manage, we can hopefully reduce the amount of calves with failure of passive transfer. And in doing so, we should be able to reduce the risk and incidence of disease, reduce the amount of time and labour treating sick calves, reduce the amount of antibiotics we're using on farm. Importantly, um, not, not, it's again, it's not just about the acute disease at the time. Um, it's also about the lifelong productiv productivity impacts that we see. And we know that back to that sort of epigenetics Ginny was discussing, there are, you know, we can switch off genes with diseases as, as well as nutrition. So we can have long term productivity impacts in these calves. And obviously in doing all of that, we're going to improve health, welfare and productivity and therefore sustainability of, of the business and also, you know, in the world of carbon efficiency, obviously that is going to be good news too. So the the area that is far less understood is the value of monitoring um, immunoglobulin in older calves. And as I say, this is what we're, we're carrying on with. We're, we're lucky to receive an Innovate grant and there is still far more data to come on this area, but this what I'm going to present and has allowed us to develop thresholds is provisional data, um, which I think you'll hopefully find quite interesting. So just some background data on the sort of sample set that we're dealing with. So the um, calf age at entry uh, to the collection centres when the testing occurred has ranged from 11 to 70 days with the vast majority really between being 14 and 40 days. Um, that's sort of the highest category. Um, in terms of the test outputs, we were seeing a range of um, immunoglobulin IgG antibody ranging from you know virtually zero just you know from one to around 40 milligrams per mil but again the vast majority running between the sort of expected range of four and 22 mg per mil in terms of what proportion of calves we have seen at different thresholds of um, antibodies so based on milligrams per mil we've got two different ages of calves here so I've looked we've looked at calves percentage of calves at each below each threshold between 14 and 27 days of age and 28 and 42 days of age. However, these percentages seem to be relatively similar for both. So we used a, a threshold of below seven and a half milligrams per mil, then around 15% of calves were below that threshold in our sample set. If we used a threshold of 10 milligrams, we're coming on close to a third of the calves being below the threshold which is um, and that 10 milligram per mil threshold is the, in the first week of life is the standard for considering failure of passive transfer 
And if we use the 12 and a half mig threshold, then we get up closer to 40% in both data sets. So I'm just going to show you a slide on, on on impacts on weight gain. So this is very much just to repeat. This is the age the calf was tested um, and then the impact following that. So when we talk between calves tested between 14, 28 days, that's the time the calf was aged, the calf was tested, and then we're looking at the long term impacts of what we saw as a result of that. Now, there's an awful lot of data that's come out of our analysis, and at the moment, I'm only going to focus on the significant findings, i.e. those that would be sort of publishable in the literature. That means that really the chances that these outcomes are by chance are very low, and that these therefore are, are, are like to be very real results. Um, there's a lot more data there with trends that haven't quite reached the significant levels yet, and hopefully with the Innovate study taking us forward, we will get greater understanding of that. But these are the, the major sort of significant outcomes of our work so far. So in calves tested between 14 and 28 days of age, for every single unit increase of IgG, so it's a calf move from 9 to 10 to 11 to 12 and so on and so forth, at 10 weeks uh, or 10 weeks weighing after entry, that every increase in unit resulted in 168 grams increase in weight at that 10 week time period. So, and that, that was, that's again significant. So there's a clear correlation with an increase in IgG in those calves and an increase in weight at the point of yeah, 10 weeks later. Likewise, if we looked at calves tested at the same age range between 14 and 28 days of age at point of entry, and we used the 10 milligram threshold, so calves that were above 10 milligrams, uh, as opposed to calves that were below the 10 milligram threshold, showed a 10% improvement in daily live weight gain when measured at 10 weeks. So again, 10 weeks later, those calves were growing 10% 10, 10 more every day uh, if they were above that 10 milligram threshold. So that's really quite huge. If we look right through to 42 days, so in calves that were tested between 14 and 42 days of age um, and used a 12 and a half milligram per mil threshold, i.e. so the calves again above that as opposed to below it, we saw a 6% improvement in daily live weight gain when measured at 10 weeks. So again, even at 40, in calves up to 42 days of age, we were seeing a significant effect of, of um, the level of IgG on performance. In terms of antibiotic use, so this is the the whole time they were in rear at the at the unit. Um, again, we've got some, some very significant results. Um, so again, in calves tested between 14 and 28 days, again for every single unit increase in IgGs, again as the calf moved from 9 to 10, 11, 12, and upwards, we saw a 5% reduction in antibiotic use as measured by mix per PCU in the rearing period. So again, a, a highly correlated link between antibiotic usage and the level of IgG these calves had. And again, in calves tested between 14 and 42 days of age, um, and we used the seven and a half milligram threshold, and say there's 15, around 15 percent at that level. The calves that were above that seven and a half milligram threshold, as opposed to below it, show the 46, almost a 50 percent reduction in antibiotic use during their rearing period, which again is a hugely significant result and you know and very exciting that we can see that um, outcome. As I say, there is more to come, but this is allowed, this data has helped us, um, provisional data has helped us set provisional thresholds and the thresholds that we're suggesting um, as and until um, this the Innovate project is complete is on the basis of these results and on the basis of the percentage of calves at these thresholds that for the younger cars, we stick to the relatively standard thresholds of uh, failure at less than 10 milligrams per mil. This sort of amber that you could do better is likely still have an effect between 10 and 15 and success over 15. And for older cars between 14 and 42 days of age, that failure to be considered less than seven and a half, amber between seven and a half and 12 and a half. And remember, we saw those effects on weight gain, 6% reductions in daily weight gain uh, at that level below 12 and a half and success over 12 and a half. So that's the threshold to be set provisionally. Um, it may be that as we get more data in, we will look to adjust them slightly. Um, but that's that's where we sit at the moment. So in our hope is in th with this test that we can 
uh, this test can help reduce the instance of failure of passive transfer by improving the monitoring for it. They say we can reduce um, uh, the, the level of susceptible cars and therefore the reduced levels of infectious disease, reduce antibiotic use, improve animal welfare, reduce the cost to the farm in terms of labour and medicine, etc. Optimise our productivity and ultimately improve overall production efficiency with all the sustainability for both the business and carbon and, and so forth. So um, that's very much our hope that this will achieve that. Uh, for the veterinary surgeon, the advantage of this test is we have an, uh, an accurate direct measure of IgG we can take onto farm, that we can use this test beyond seven days of age, that samples can be taken and discussed in real time. Um, that we can have our clients taking these samples and therefore we can get far more routine monitoring of FPT on our farms as opposed to sporadic, you know, a lot of the time often what's quite sporadic reactive responses to issues. And we've got a very a fully quantitative test, so rather than yes or no, you know, we're not going to slap someone on the back if they've got a, a, a result of 11 and say you're fine. We still know there's a lot of room for improvement, for instance. So that concludes uh, and I will pass it back to Rachel. Thank you. Well, thanks Alistair. So just to summarise, essentially the animals of green or amber status, um, they showed an incredible 11% improvement, in, sorry 10% improvement in daily live weight gain and 46% reduction in antibiotic use. So it just shows that if we can routinely monitor IgG status, we've got a phenomenal opportunity within the industry to keep continuously improving. And now on the subject of continuously improving, I would like to move to our final session with Dominic McKenzie, Farm Manager of Butelar Group. So Dominic, um, could you please begin just with an introduction to yourself and your role as Farm Manager at Butelar? Uh, sure. Uh, so I manage the Beautiful Art Research and Development Farm in Somerset. My background is in the uh, in the dairy industry, um, and I've been at the Beautiful Art Group for about two and a half years now. Uh, so really, only just starting to specialise in uh, calf rearing. Great. And could you tell us a little bit about what you're trying to achieve as farm manager at Beautiful Art? Uh, so some of our achievements over the past eighteen months uh, have been through our uh, uh, processes and protocols uh, that were designed in partnership with Synergy. Um, we've successfully reduced our antibiotics, antibiotic usage by 60% uh, at the same time maintaining, a, maintaining an average daily live weight gain of 1.2 and keeping mortality to a minimum. Uh, so this so far this year uh, we're running at 1% uh, to date. Uh, but I would say by the end of the year we'd be we'd be looking at about two. Uh, this is obviously due to the seasonal weather changes. Over the last two years, we've set up Long Lane as an industry leading trial facility. Uh, this is for the purpose of um, uh, commercially uh, to to trial the commercial viability of products, um, and also. Um, uh, set it up as a, a unit to support uh, agribusinesses with facility in the team to allow confidence in results. Great. Phenomenal achievements, especially your mortality rates. I think, you know, we've talked about how this is a higher risk system, so um, you're doing phenomenally well on that front. Now, from your experience, what effect do non-performing calves have on the business? Uh, so we found calves that score low uh, are nearly always poor doers. Uh, you can usually see that they start to stand out during the first two weeks on farm. Um, by that point, they've really already impacted the rest of the batch. Uh, calves achieving low daily live weight gains impact our profit margins because uh, they slow through throughput. Um, they also need additional attention and require higher and higher than average antibiotic usage. Poor doers also really add stress to the staff. Um, they increase health checking times and uh, I find uh, yeah, it's, it sort of lowers job uh, satisfaction. Um, poor performers take, also take longer to finish, which in turn decreases the supply chain sustainability. Yeah, I think everyone's been there or could sort of, um, if they've reared calves, have got those ones that are just poor doers, they don't thrive no matter what you try. 
So how long now have you been using the immunity test and what are the impacts that you've seen? Uh, so we've been using the test regularly for the past year. Uh, looking at the data we collect, it's easy to see the correlation between calves that score low and increased days on farm uh, and increases in antibiotic usage. Uh, the ones you always suspect to be poor performers, you can now back up your knowledge with the results. This allows us to make changes to our protocols and gives calves uh, a fair chance when we can. And then just in terms of practicality and welfare, Dominic, what have your experiences been using the test? Uh, so the test is really easy to use, uh, whether on farm or in the collection centre. There's very little bleeding straight after the test. Uh, and not much sign the calf has been tested 10 minutes after. When the calves first arrive, they can easily be tested behind a hurdle with little stress uh, or alternatively in our system during the weighing and grading uh, at the collection centre. Uh, so this will be before heading to a farm destination. Uh, really, in my opinion, the test is uh, uh, a low invasive solution. Great. And then what are the, the aspirations for Butylar when using this test? What is it that you're trying to achieve? Uh, so the, the test will allow us how we to, how we treat batches of calves. Um, once the low scoring calves have been identified, we can pen them separately from the rest of the batch. Uh, this will reduce the spread of disease and potentially allow non-performers a little more room to encourage better growth. Uh, ultimately, we would like to promote better practice at the start of the calves' lives. Um, the results will allow us to offer evidence-based advice, uh, for example, maybe through um, we'd be able to set up a bonus scheme um, or uh, obviously if uh, the source routinely underperforms, um, potentially a decision would have to be made to no longer use them as a supplier. Great. Thanks, Dominic, for taking the time today to share your experiences of using the test, especially important as uh, one of the, the innovating parties. So we've now reached the, the end of today's webinar session. Um, just before we get stuck into the Q&A session, I would like to say thank you all to you for giving up your lunch today to join us. Thank you to our excellent speakers, Ginny, Dominic, Joe, Alistair, for sharing your work and your experiences using the test. Now, if you would like further information about the Immunogy bovine IgG test, or if you'd like to place an order, then if you could reach out to us using the contact details on the screen, I will also add a link to our website into the chat box and we'll now get stuck into the Q&A. So if you do have any questions that you haven't yet submitted and you would like to ask, if I could ask you to put them into the Q&A section now. So the first question that I can see here is from Ben. Um, has the immunity test been validated in sick calves? We avoid serum total protein in sick calves. Does the same apply? Um, Alistair, would you like to, to handle that one? Uh, I, I, certainly we are taking samples from calves at the collection centre that you know, uh, you know, 24 hours later will have developed problems. Um, so when it says validate, I guess it's really a question of what that concern is it, it, in terms of whether that validates against performance or validates against other tests, you know, the, the, the gold standard. So um, I think as really as Dominic alluded, you know, it's very predictive of what's likely to happen to the calf in that sense. And I don't think, it, you know, the IgG level won't be um, I think the IgG level you detect will be relevant to the risk of that calf becoming diseased or being diseased at that time. So yes, it will correlate, um, but we haven't made a specific focus of looking at sick calves and and really focus, you know, looking at the IgG level uh, per se. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, so our next question was submitted by Paula. Uh, did you say that because it's run on whole blood, the results are about 70% of the results in serum? Does that mean that you need to do the maths for any that are borderline if you want to be sure if it's failure or not? Also, is it affected by dehydration? And finally, uh, what is the rough price? So just regarding the price one, um, we do have multiple different countries, multiple different currencies on the phone today. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just reaching out to us using the contact details on the screen, um, we'll be happy to get back to you with a, a specific price for your territory. Um, so really, the, the rest of that question was about how do they relate to um, 
serum results as opposed to whole blood? And do you need to do any of the maths back? Um, Alistair, Joe, I'm not sure who would prefer to take that question. Well, I'll start and Alistair can correct me and finish. But um, yeah, so if you, if you think about it logically, uh, when you're looking at whole blood, you've got, you know, red cells and uh, him, you know, all, all those sort of aspect formed elements. So um, that's why it's only 70% of the, the values. But the thresholds Alistair was quoting were based on the whole blood values, were they not, Alistair? Yes, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it's like any any sort of test you have, you you know, it's it would be very very dangerous to use different thresholds and targets across different types of tests. You should really establish normal ranges, for partly for your own environment, and certainly for for the specific type of test that you are using. And I think that's why some of those thresholds that Alistair was showing earlier on are, are so important and so useful so um it, it, it's always dangerous to compare uh say a whole blood value with the literature that might have used plasma or or, or serum or, or or you know a different sample medium so i think in the external validation the the we're consistently about uh, sort of the, uh, the stats suggested about a 0.7 mg per mil lower than the the uh, commercial ELISA, but it wasn't actually ultimately a, a huge difference, but lower and because of that issue that Joe has talked about. Uh, in relation to dehydration, we haven't measured um, the uh, the levels of dehydration, you know, in the animals that we were testing, we've just taken samples, but certainly the likely is, and Joe, please jump back in here, that yes, if it, you know, because it's a mix per mil, if an animal's dehydrated, that might have an effect, um, but I'll pass that back to Joe. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a vet. I know sort of in, in human people, we we would um, use a sort of Dylan Costill equation to do the, to the correction for hydration status. But um, yeah, we, we haven't specifically looked into the hydration stage, but you would think, yeah, if, if the blood's hema concentrated, then that would affect the values very slightly. But, you, you know, you're not going to be talking big percentages. I would have thought, you know, 10% absolutely maximum. It's a good point and I think there's always the opportunity that if there's any uncertainty or you're not sure of an animal's sort of status in terms of hydration, they can be retested um, once you've addressed their hydration status. I also think it was very important what you said, Joe, about validating for a specific test. Now, I think that the vets on the call will all be very aware that depending on what diagnostic laboratory you use, they do report back different normal reference ranges for the same type of test or the same parameter. And that's because each test essentially becomes validated um, to have its own normals or own uh, reference ranges. So we always recommend using the reference ranges that this test has been validated against. Um, now we do have another question here submitted by Hannah. Uh, methods for the evaluation of CAV IgG absorption in the description of some of the methods, it was mentioned that a blood sample from the vein is required. Is that because of the need for venous blood or is it simply a matter of having enough blood for centrifug centrifugation slash production of serum? It's simply a matter that you need enough blood to be able to process the sample because they need greater quantities of blood because you are having to get a, a serum or plasma sample. So that's not going to be work in the, a situation like we are using where we can use a Lancet. So you are all these tests rely, other tests rely on obtaining a standard sort of vacutain or, you know, blood sample. And that's going to be taken from the jugular and the young calf because tail veins, etc., are just going to be too small. Great. And then uh, Hannah, again, do you have any knowledge about how the IgG level measured in older calves is related to the calves IgG level in week one? So I have got, so I haven't presented that. We do have some, we, we haven't been able to do a study 
because it would require a home office license to do you know day day one and then sequentially sample the animal and see but we have got data from different ages and we can see a, a gentle degradation of igg over time so there it does there is a and we understand the half-life of igg there is work on that already already published on there so we've got some idea of the degradation levels um so yes we do expect in other cars there to be gradually reducing levels of igg that said they say that's why the, the you know the importance of those cutoffs and that and data analysis because even with that we can still see the points of where we're getting that significant effect of of uh, the certain levels so um it is a study we would quite like to do but it's unfortunately a complicated study because there's no rationale to be constantly sequentially sampling the calf and looking at its igg so uh yeah nice study to do but unfortunately um uh, logistically or legally or technically more more, more complex to win and com expensive yeah. to to do i agree alistair hannah it's a great question and I, i've been itching to, <laughs> to try and get um synergy to do a longitudinal study but we do have the constraints of you know repeated sampling needing the home office license Great, thank you both. Uh, so we have a question from Alexandra now. Was there any agreement stats, e.g. bland Altman plots or Kappa, done on the test with the reference test ELISA? Obviously the correlation you present is very strong, but wondering if any investigation done on agreement, great presentation and exciting developments for CAV Health. Yeah, like <laughs> the, the short answer is yes. And from Bland Altman perspective, it, it looks very good. We didn't show that because um, there's a wide audience today, but that will come out in the publication, which was, uh, you know, the, the data was analysed by the independent uh, research organisation rather than ourselves. Um, but they have supplied those blended almond, almond charts and, and they look incredibly good, as good as the correlation. I take your point about correlation. You could have just one incredibly high value that would um, give you a spuriously high correlation. But as, as you saw on the chart, the agreement of the values below 20 was phenomenal. They, were, they literally stuck to the line of identity in comparison to ELISA. Great, and we have our final question, unless anyone submits one in the next few moments from Louise. How much are the results affected if the cube reading is done after th 10 minutes, for instance, an additional 30 seconds or one minute? That's a great question. So it, it is the chemistry will keep working and changing for about oh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, if, if you're a few seconds out, it's not going to make any difference at all. Um, towards a minute, you might see a minor shift, but um, our argument is you should always follow the test instructions and adhere to the protocol. And I know in the practical world that isn't always easy and someone might come in and talk to you while you're in the testing session. So 20, 30 seconds either way isn't going to be significant, but a few minutes would be. If I might jump in there, Rachel, just as a Joe did we um when you get experience with this, um while well, you say you can be running a test every twenty seconds, so it obviously takes ten minutes to incubate, but then you've got your, your slides lined up and you can just be banging them on and off so we can I say rapidly process a large number of casts fairly quickly. Um when you start out, whether you're probably sensible to try and just do one every thirty seconds just to give you that extra bit of time and, and um used to handling the cube and, and so on and so forth. But um yeah, yeah, the actually the technical bit from Joe there. Great, thank you. And we do have another question submitted from Paula. Is it affected by extreme temperatures? Is it better to run it indoors? No, another great question. So uh, some other tests, we, we have a cortisol test that has uh, is a lot more exposed to temperature variation. We, we've run the IgG test uh, four degrees, 22, um, 37, and, and there is no impact. I think the big molecules, the proteins, are very, very robust. It's just the small molecules like hormones that can be affected by temperature. So, no, it's very robust. So it's good in all sorts of environments. The only temperature isn't a problem. Well, one factor can be problematic is humidity. Um, 
so when you take the cassette out of the foil pouch that it comes uh, housed in, there is a colour indicating silica gel that tells you if it's been exposed to too much um, ambient moisture. But, you know, if you're using that within 30 minutes, even in Malaysia, you're going to be fine. But I, I wouldn't take a, a cassette out of a foil package um, and, and leave it out overnight and use it the next day. But temperature is absolutely fine. Great question. Excellent. And we have another great question on a, a similar note from Chris. It was mentioned that the blood buffer solution was robust. Can samples be taken and then analysed 24 hours later or even longer? Yeah, okay. no, great question. Thank, thanks for these good questions. So, yeah, once that capillary tube, that's just 10 microliters of, of blood goes in the two mil of buffer, that's stable at room temperature for, well, weeks and months. So it, it's quite possible that you're, you know, you're firefighting, you're collecting all your samples and you may not analyze them straight away. But if it's the next day, if it's a week later, or a week later, it's too much, too late to, to act upon. But in terms of practical um, application, the, the, it's it's very, very robust at room temperature. If you were to keep them for, for longer than a few weeks, let's say you're doing a research project, I would just put them at four degrees, but um, we have them out in the lab at room temperature for, for, for weeks and they're very, very stable. Excellent. Thank you, Joel. Well, I think that draws us to a conclusion because we don't have any additional questions. So again, just a, a final note to say thank you to all who have attended. Thank you to all of our speakers. Our contact details are on the screen and we would be absolutely delighted to hear from you. Um, and thank you for joining us today. Take care and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.